Welcome to the Books and Travel Podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn. In today's episode, I talk to David Morrell about the research behind his historical fiction novels set in London in the 1850s. David talks about how he dealt with personal grief by diving deep into a different world. And it's interesting to think that we can travel to a different place by travelling to a different time through research. I talked to Alison Morton about this theme in episode 29 on how she uses ancient Rome in her alternate history novels. And I also feel it here in my home city of Bath, which I talked about last time in episode 40. There are so many layers to these ancient cities that you can glimpse a different place if you delve deeper. David talks about Thomas de Quincey and some of his contemporaries like Wordsworth and his links to London and the Lake District. We also talk about addiction to laudanum and how that affected de Quincey's writing and how he even predated Freud with some of his ideas about the subconscious and then how he wrote about the Ratcliffe Highway murders. I love the quote that David mentions. The human mind is composed of chasms and sunless abysses, layer upon layer, in which there are secret chambers where alien natures can hide undetected. Part of being a writer for me is trying to delve into these chasms and layers and bring back stories somehow. If you don't know David Morrell's other books, he's probably most famous for his novel First Blood, which was adapted into Rambo and became a franchise in its own right. But it's one of those cases where the film has little bearing on the book and David's other books as a writer. He is just fantastic. I love his books. He writes all over the thriller map and he also writes in horror, historical fiction. He writes essays. Uh, He's just multi-creative, basically. And I've met David a number of times over the years and he is known as the professor in the thriller community. He is passionate about his research and his books are always varied and detailed. He's also wonderful in the way he helps other writers and I definitely count him as a writing mentor from afar. I also love his enthusiasm for research and he does a lot of it because I have the same drive when I write my fiction. I spend a lot of time making sure things are correct as much as possible and I travel to see places and take a lot of pictures when that's possible. So I hope you enjoy this interview. David Morrell is the multi-award winning and many times best-selling author of over 30 books, as well as short stories, essays, comics and collaborations that have sold millions of copies and are available in many different languages. He has a PhD in American literature and was a professor of literature at the University of Iowa. His novel First Blood became the Rambo franchise, but today we're talking about the Thomas de Quincey historical mysteries set in Victorian London. The first in the series is Murder as a Fine art. So welcome, David. Welcome. It's nice to chat with you. We've known each other quite a few years now, and it's always fun, despite the distance. It's uh, fun to have the opportunity to get together and chat. Indeed. So what first drew you to historical London? Because you don't live anywhere near here, and the idea behind (laughs) the De Quincey books. I I don't live anywhere. If people are curious, I live in the United States in a state called New Mexico, And since we're talking about travels, you'd be surprised how many people in the United States do not know that New Mexico is a state in the United States. (laughs) And sometimes I I remember uh, sending away to the Museum of Modern Art in New York or something. I think it was Christmas card. And they said, we don't ship to a foreign country. And we said, what? you mean? And she said, New Mexico, it's a foreign country. No, it is not a foreign country. And this is our zip code for mailing. And they had to go to a supervisor who finally said, you know what, I think New Mexico is in the union. So (laughs) that's brilliant. 
<laughs> so there you are. <laughs> and uh, New Mexico gets featured a lot in, in movies and Westerns, particularly. So sometimes uh, a classic movie like Silverado was filmed uh, near here, for example. But anyhow, yes, I've always been interested in the Victorians. At my, I'm from Canada, so I share a kind of interest in the UK and because we're all in the Commonwealth. And the short version is that my granddaughter, Natalie, died in 2009 from a rare bone cancer. And our son had died years earlier from the same rare bone cancer. And my wife and I, and of course our daughter, whose child it was, we were devastated. And I happened to see a, a TV, uh, not a TV movie, but I happened to see a film called Creation about Charles Darwin's breakdown when he was writing on the origin of species and uh, the breakdown was because his favorite daughter had died and in the midst of the movie somebody shows up to explain his breakdown by saying Charles there are people like Thomas de Quincey who maintain that we can be controlled by thoughts and emotions we don't know we have and this sounded so much like Freud that I wondered if the movie was making it up because it was set in the 1850s. And Freud's the turn of the century. So it turned out that De Quincey did anticipate uh, Freud. In fact, he invented the word subconscious. And so as, a, as an escape, really, from grief, I time traveled. Do you know a book called Time and Again uh, by Jack Finney? Oh, yeah. Okay, yep. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and when there's that eerie feeling when you read it that you're in, in that case New York City I, I believe it's in the 1890s and it just I, I I felt reading that book I was like that it just been a time travel and I thought maybe I could convince myself I was time traveling so I decided to go into the world of Thomas de Quincey and that meant particularly the 1850s. And now de Quincey by then was living in, in Edinburgh in Scotland. So I did a little violation of history, the only one apart from the plot that's a violation of history and set him in England, in London in 1854. And then began years of research into de Quincey and his works and the Victorian, the mid-Victorian era and made friends. With. So I just immersed myself and I can't tell you how much, how rewarding it was to feel that I was back then. Mm. And just in case people don't know Thomas de Quincey, of course they can read the book, but just tell us a bit about him and what was so fascinating to you about him as a character. Oh, absolutely. And just for identification, the books we're talking about are Murder as a Fine Art, Inspector of the Dead, and Ruler of the Night. And uh, De Quincey and his daughter Emily are the main characters of the three of them. De Quincey is most famous for having written a book called Confessions of an English Opium Eater. And that was all the way back uh, in 1821. And Laudanum was the only effective painkiller in the UK at that time. It's a mixture of alcohol and opium, and it was as common in medicine cabinets of the day as aspirin is common, common in our medicine cabinets now. And despite having... having uh, opium in it, it was absolutely legal. It was freely, it was uh, universally available. You could buy it from the paper boy, from the kid on the corner selling papers. You could buy it in the grocery store. They had a different term for it then. You could buy it sometimes from your landlord, your tailor. It was everywhere and it was cheap. Now, everybody knew that there was a tendency to want more of it just amuses me so much that we had a nation that was addicted to a narcotic, but they had no notion of the of addiction. That was a later concept, and they called it a habit. And what's the matter with you? Don't you have the strength of character to defeat this habit you got yourself into? Mm. When it when in fact it was affecting people's bodies and their minds. And De Quincey started taking it as a student at Oxford for a toothache. And he took it recreationally 
as we say, that's not a term he would have used, on the weekend, say, uh, for several years, uh, claimed, he, he sounds like somebody in the 60s smoking dope and listening to music. He claimed that he could hear notes between notes at conferences or at, at uh, concerts, and he claimed that he could distinguish all the conversations in a, at a marketplace and things like that. And then he was a friend of Wordsworth. Uh, in fact, he stalked Wordsworth as a youngster. And Wordsworth had a daughter named Catherine, and Catherine died very young at the age of three. From There's still some question about what may have killed her that may have been a, a congenital disease. And De Quincey adopted her because one of his sisters had died young. And again, talking about travel, one of my favorite places in the, in England is uh, Grasmere in the Lake District. Have you been there? Yes, so, yeah, you're, absolutely. You're almost, hmm. you're in Bath. And so you've been, you, yes, you, I, I would assume it's so close that you, 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 you've gone there. <laughs> it, it's uh, so you know, close in a British sense in that it's about yeah. f- six hours drive. For, in America's terms, that's close. <laughs> that's close here. It is a distance for you, but I love the Lake District. And Grasmere, and, and there's a place there as called Dove Cottage, and Wordsworth had lived there for several years. And uh, as a young man, as I said, we're off a field, but it does fit our topic of travel. Uh, he had gone there as a companion of Coleridge, the, got the people he knew, and, and met Wordsworth and became a family friend. And when Wordsworth moved out of Dove Cottage because his family was too big. De Quincey moved in. And so De Quincey, in fact, lived longer in Dove Cottage than Wordsworth had. I just love all all this connection. Mm. And anyhow, so Catherine died and took De Quincey took to clawing at her grave nights. Oh goodness. <laughs> it's a it's a small community and the church is really beautiful. And and anyhow, she would claw at her grave and he started taking more and more opium in the form of laudanum until finally he was in our parlance hooked. So he began writing about opium in a way that nobody else ever had and uh, opened up the whole topic of maybe this isn't as so good for us. Let's be careful. But he couldn't stop taking it. And he lived uh, to be 74. And he was drinking, this is hard to believe, but a teaspoonful, normally you put it in water, 20 drops in water. A teaspoonful would, if we sat down, you and I, and say, oh, let's try some of this, we'd be dead. (laughs) Uh, It's that potent if you weren't used to it. And De Quincey was drinking a pint of it a day. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Astonishing. Uh, and, and as he thought about this and what it was doing to him, because we think of narcotics as being a soporific, but at the time, particularly in the University of Edinburgh, which was a very big medical establishment, there was, there was a lot of talk about opium being an exciter for some people. And for De Quincey, it was an exciter. It didn't put him to sleep. He stayed up for days. And it was in these frenzies during the day. If He might have been, in our terms, manic depressive. He was manic a lot. And in his frenzies, he wrote and wrote. And one of the things he, and then he'd have these nightmares when he did fall asleep. And he tried to account for the nightmares. And that was when he came up with the idea of the subconscious. Uh, you can tell I just find this guy so fascinating. Mm, yeah. Uh, and here's one of his quotes. This is a kind of crammed together of two statements. The human mind is composed of chasms and sunless abysses, layer upon layer, in which there are secret chambers where alien natures can hide undetected. And that's Freud. But it's way before Freud, and he's talking about schizophrenia in a way. He's talking about um, multiple personalities. He's talking about latent memories. One of his other quotes is, there is no such thing as forgetting. Memories are like the stars. They disappear 
in the daytime, but they come out at night. Do you think that sort of interest in the darker side was what drew him to the murders? The murders occurred in 1811, and just to, just for so bring people up to date, my murders of fine art is a novel about the first publicized mass murders in English history. And people, when I say that, people always think I mean Jack the Ripper, but that's the late 1880s. And uh, we're talking about the Ratcliffe Highway murders in London in 1811. And the Ratcliffe Highway was near the docks in London. And the demarcation is the Tower of London. Anything east of the Tower of London was uh, East London. That was where the docks were, the East India Company. And uh, Radcliffe Highway, which was just a lane, it had been a highway at one time, above the docks, uh, it, it was shops and places where, where sailors and, and merchants and for the docks uh, went. And there had been on a Saturday night, midnight in, in December, uh, a hideous murder in a, in a clothing store, for lack of a better word, in which the proprietor his wife, his shop assistant, and a infant, and the infant is the key here, had been brutally murdered. And it, it was discovered because he had sent a, a another assistant, a shop girl, out to pay a bill at midnight for actually pay two bills, and neither place had been open. And when she came back, the door was locked, and she started hammering on the door. And a neighbor next door said, you're waking me up. What's the problem? And she said, I can't get in. And he said, I'll crawl over the back. I'll go in my back area and I'll crawl over the wall and I'll go in through the back and find out what the heck's going on. He went in and there was blood everywhere. It was, ha- it was dripping from the rafters. The, the killer had used a, a ship carpenter's mallet, which has a spike on one end and a hammer on the other. And, the, and the, 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 the moment is that he had not only killed the infant, but the infant was in a wicker pram. And he had then smashed the pram with the hammer until the wicker were in small bits. And then he had, as it were, buried the the youngster, the child, almost an infant, beneath it. This is horrific. And, And De Quincey in 1811 was so struck by this because what had happened is, even though it happened in London, nobody known about anything like this happening before it could have happened. Maybe, but nobody knew about it. And London had many newspapers and magazines at the time. And because of the macadamized road uh, system, which had just been the last 10 years, say, been implemented. And because of that, they had the English mail coach, which could travel at the relentless speed of 10 miles an hour. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. And it was a very reliable mail system. You can see I really immersed myself in the period and this is all in, in the novel. And, and, and you could, if a mail coach left from Edinburgh and a mail coach left for London and bound for the opposite cities, they would always meet at the same bridge. Uh, it was that reliable. And they had a sta- what we call stagecoach stations, American movies where they have these stagecoach stations and they, they show up and they change the horses and maybe they use a privy and they eat something and off they go again. England had these stations every 10 or 20 miles. And so with that relentless speed which for, for them, and all these newspapers and magazines setting off the next day after the murder, within three days, everyone in England and Scotland and Wales, we, I, I'm assuming, knew about it. And it took just a little longer to get the word to Ireland and everything shut down. That nothing like this had ever happened in the United States the, in my lifetime. The closest this ever happened was Truman Capote wrote a novel called In Cold Blood about a farmer of, and his family who had been murdered senselessly in Kansas. And uh, the idea that someone would just show up and kill you was, especially in a rural you know community like that, was was shocking. And But in London, here we are in a populated area. And so people were hiring bodyguards. They were putting on extra doors and, and shutters on their houses all over England. The place shut down. And then 10 days later, it happened again. 
And oh boy, the hysteria was is almost und- indescribable. Read read items from the period where they're just baffled. It's 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 like it, like the effect of the pandemic. Now it hadn't happened in anybody's lifetime. They didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. NC saved every magazine and newspaper he could he, he could find. And he was a pack rat, and he'd leave them. He was always on the run from debtors, so he kept leaving. Uh, <laughs> he kept leaving suitcase, what we call suitcases and things, filled with all these papers wherever he was hiding, and then he'd run off, and they didn't know what to do with it. And often, often they saved the proprietor, saved the, the, the materials. And in 1854, which is when Murder as a Fine Artist said, he he was having a collection of his works coming out and they needed more material. And he said, I'll write about the 1811 murders. And he wrote an essay. Uh, he wrote so many famous essays, but this one was called on murder as considered as one of the fine arts. And in it, a men's club meets once a month to praise mass murderers <laughs> addresses. I just love this addresses the Ratcliffe Highway Murders of 1811, in which the, the author of the essay, it's a fic, it's a Swift's Gulliver's Travels, or the a Modest Proposal, where the narrator just goes on and on about how the man who killed all those people was a genius on the bloody stage of life and things of that nature. And in that essay, there are three of them, He'd written two installments earlier, and this was the third one. So if you all get interested and you want to read this, which is historically important, the first two, uh, murder is uh, murder considered as one of the fine arts, and then there's a part two ten years later. These are more general about mass murderers, but the third installment, which was published in 1854, invented what we think of as the true crime genre in which he, for 50 blood-soaked pages, recreates the murders Mm. using cross-cutting techniques between the murderer and the the shop girl outside pounding on the door and she hears heavy breathing on the other side. Oh, it's just wonderful. And I had the idea that this essay, the third installment, came out in 1854 in uh, the fall, in the autumn, And I had the idea that come December, on the anniversary of the murders back in 1811, that they would start again. And that the the newly created Mm. uh, Scotland Yard would say, he's got to be the guy. He's he's an an opium addict. He's, He's just obsessed with these murders. He must be committing them himself. But then when they get there, he find, they find he's 69 years old. He's four foot 11. <laughs> <laughs> and his daughter, who, witty, wonderful Emily, says, who was real, says, will you please look at this man? Do you really think he was capable of killing four people at once with a ship carpenter's hammer? And so he and Scotland Yard set up to, to find out who's doing this. And the appeal for me was, that Scotland Yard at the time, it had only been created a few years earlier in 1842, 12 years. And they thought they were hot stuff because they made plaster casts of footprints at crime scenes. And, and the Quincy's telling them about the chasms and sunless abysses of the human mind. And they, of course, think he's nuts. But between the two of them, they do find the killer and I think I solved in the novel, I think I solved who killed, who did the 1811 murders, because it's all very historic, very historic. Yeah, and you clearly immerse yourself so much, and I know that you always do your research. But I wondered about the actual trips. So you've talked about Grasmere and the Lake District, but what were some of the places you visited in London, and how do you go about doing your on-location research? I've seen some of the pictures, and I'll link to those in the show notes, but any particular places that were really resonant for you? I've been to England, to London, every let us say maybe three years, but now I was seeing London from a different point of view. And the mid-Victorian period, 1854 and uh, 55, London, which is when these books are set, 
the World War II destroyed many of the locations and those that weren't destroyed by uh, German bombing during the Blitz, for example, they were destroyed in other ways of, of by fire, for example. One of the great regrets is that it's impossible to visit the, the, the great crystal building that was um, in Hyde Park during the so-called Crystal Palace exhibition, the first World's Fair in the Hyde Park in 1851. And this was so huge essentially a large greenhouse, and Prince Albert had the idea that's what it would look like. It was so huge that full-grown elm trees were dwarfed in it, and and there were birds that had been in the trees when this building was erected around it, and the birds were creating a problem, so they brought in hawks. <laughs> I just <laughs> love this stuff. They brought in hawks to, to kill the birds that were living in the Crystal Palace. Did, did you know we still use hawks in the underground? No, I didn't. Yeah, uh, there are still uh, birds of prey hunting pigeons in the in the railway stations of London. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't know. That's a, uh, Now, do they live there or do hawkers, do falconers well, come? Well, they have them as part of the train service. They're like employed by the trains. <laughs> are you kidding? That's wonderful. <laughs> I thought you'd uh, like that. So ba- oh, back on the World's Fair, sorry. Uh, the uh, World's, the, the Crystal Palace, which it was so big that a, a 200-person orchestra could barely be heard at the far end of the Crystal Palace. Just rebuilt in 1854, and it remained there until the the 1930s when it was destroyed by a fire. And there, every once in a while, I hear from my remote place here in New Mexico, I hear that there are plans to rebuild the Crystal Palace, and that would be a sight to behold. But other places were destroyed in, in, in the bombings. But there are there is one place in particular that still exists on Piccadilly, uh, across from Green Park. So Lord Palmerston had been Secretary of War. He'd been Secretary of the Foreign Secretary. We call him Secretary of State here. And he then had eventually become uh, Prime Minister. And he purchased a home, uh, a a large residence that had been owned by one of the Queen's relatives, the Duke of Cambridge. And this house was known as Cambridge House. And it is on Piccadilly, across from Green Park, very desirable uh, location. And it still exists and it is easily identifiable because... On Piccadilly, it is the only recessed property. Everything else is even with the sidewalk, but Cambridge House is set back and has, it's not an adjoining building. It has uh, open space on the right and the left. It is a separate building. And it is, he lived there for a number of years, and then after his, his passing, it was purchased by a nautical club, which had, there were two gates, and the problem was which gate to use to go in and out given traffic. So the club put in and out, in on one gate and out on the other gate, and this became uh, known as, it sounds almost like a pornographic club, forgive me, but it was known as the in and out club. (laughs) And and it was known like that for many years until it was again purchased. And these days uh, is owned by Russian oligarchs who have been remodeling it. When I last saw it, it was still under con- reconstruction on the interior at a cost of 250 million pounds. <laughs> yes. And I, this, the city of Westminster said this might be a bad precedent that we're going to have foreign nationals spending fortunes to purchase historical properties and that they would be private residences. And so there was a halt on, on the whether or not they could move in. And I don't know if that halt is 
still there. But you can go and look at it, and it's so eerie, as you noted. I have um, I wrote some photo essays about some of these places, and Cambridge House is one of them. The essay says eerie Lord Palmerston's house, uh, and the photos I took. Oh, by you, you almost see just think you're going to see ghosts peering from the windows. And apart from the fact that the Duke of Cambridge had owned it and that Lord Palmerston had owned it, one of the attempts on the life of Queen Victoria occurred right directly outside the building when she came to visit her, I believe it was her cousin, the Duke of Cambridge, when he was dying. And when she pulled up in her carriage, she was attacked by a mad man who actually hit her on the head and drew blood and uh, so there's a lot of history to it but for certain because especially if people don't know london if they're if they go there they want to see westminster abbey and they want to see buckingham palace well uh, a short walk through green park from uh, buckingham palace will take you to piccadilly and uh, and it will lead you directly to what I still call Cambridge House. I will say that um, in that area, Piccadilly is one of my favourite bookstores in London. For people listening, Waterstones Piccadilly uh, is is oh, yes. a fantastic yes. bookstore. And um, we're almost out of time, so we're going to stay on books. Obviously, people can get uh, your books there and all over the place. But apart from your books, are there any uh, books you would recommend that you feel give a really good sense of historical England, either that period or another period so oh, basically absolutely. book recommendations yes judith flanders has written a number of books about the victorian world one is called inside the victorian home another is called inside the victorian city she has a book called the invention of murder how the victorians reveled in death and detection and created modern crime. <laughs> uh, and any, basically anything that Judith has written about the Victorian, she's also written a wonderful a series of mysteries about a British book editor who keeps uh, getting involved in murders and solving them. And it's one of my favorite uh, series. Uh, there are a lot of titles, so I'll just say Judith Flanders. And anybody who wants to know about Thomas de Quincey, Robert Morrison's biography, and Greville Lindop's biography, his name is Anglo-Saxon. Uh, and as I said, he taught at the University of uh, Manchester. And uh, these are books that I relied on heavily. And uh, these would give a, a very rich uh, portrait of the period, but certainly Judith is the, is the historian. And uh, quickly, I want to mention St. James's Church, which also figures one of the few that wasn't destroyed in the Blitz. St. James's Church is the corner of uh, Mayfair and Soho, the south eastern section and that it was designed by sir christopher wren who did saint paul's but this is his favorite church it was designed to hold 500 people very intimate with uh distinctive tall windows which were meant at the time to have a uh, light come in and to reflect off the white walls inside and create a feeling of uh, sp of splendor and uh, saint james's still exists and I, a, a significant portion of one of the novels, Inspector of the Dead, is set in St. James's. And, but so many of the places, alas, are gone uh, for one reason or another. Uh, I had to rely on old photographs and old drawings. The train stations, for example, which these days are not attractive, I think it would be safe even for someone who is not English to say. But at the time... Those train stations were magnificent and little by little were dismantled. And the third novel, Ruler of the Night, it begins in one of those magnificent train stations and tries to recreate what it was like. It had the tallest arch in, in the West in, at the time. Things go away. I will give a shout out to St Pancras, uh, which is a beautiful station that they have actually restored. But I, I agree with you generally. <laughs> well, Euston Square or Euston Station is the one that I use. And yeah, it's horrific. <laughs> yes, forgive me if you have favourite, those who listen have their favourites. And remember, I'm a foreigner. God help me. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but Euston Station, which is the one that I'm, I used in, in the novel, it's not 
uh, not, I guess I would say, I think it's safe to say appealing. Not oh, definitely appealing, not. <laughs> but, but in its day, oh my God, it, 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 there were gold gates that opened and this huge arch. And the interior, if anybody is familiar with how, and, and in an ideal form, the interior of Grand Central Station can look when it's mm. cleaned up. That's what Houston Station looked like. Wow. So fantastic. Where can people find you and your books online? I have a website, davidmorell.net. Think of it as the network of readers, and it has a lot of information. Information. It's it, 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 it try to be very reader friendly and have a lot of, of, of things on it. And I'm on. I have a Facebook authors page, and I'm on there almost every day about books, movies, and music. I'm I'm, I'm not selling. Occasionally, I mention what I'm working on and what if I have a book coming out. But it's more like a salon. It's I, these are what are the books and movies and music and all that I'm interested in, and maybe you'll be, and we can have a conversation. And so I'm I'm and I'm on Twitter as well. And and of course, by the limitation of Twitter, I can't quite discuss things in the same way. But and again, I'm not selling. It's it's more the, the ideas that will inform ourselves. Oh, fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, David. That was great. I thank you. It, it's always fun, as I said, to chat with you. Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.